connect, explore, and engage as the American Geophysical Union continues to celebrate the year of open science. Thousands of researchers and scientists are coming together to connect, collaborate, and remain committed to the concept of opening science. Welcome to AGU 23. This is AGU TV, where today we are focusing on wide open dimensions. Welcome back to San Francisco. I'm Laura Krantz and you're watching AGU TV. Today, we are highlighting how the AGU has called for barriers to be lowered between scientists and the people they serve, making connection a priority. As we look for solutions to climate change, I will show you how we are using art to bring more people into the climate change conversation. And straight ahead, I'll introduce you to Create Connection, a project 15 years in the making. I'll show you how we are connecting with communities to help residents better understand local hazards and resiliency. The scientific landscape is ever-changing, as is the way science is communicated. How can we effectively communicate our science to the broader public? We'll discuss coming up. Straight ahead, I'll discuss the importance of science communication to both education and communities. You can find the latest AGU TV episode on the TVs placed throughout the convention center, on the in-house channels at several of our partner hotels, on the homepage of the AGU website, and on our YouTube channel and on X, formerly known as Twitter. If you've got a problem, it can be helpful to get ideas for how to solve it from lots of different people. Climate change is no different and getting more people involved might be the key to finding solutions. Aliza Lustig is the Senior Staff Manager of the National Climate Assessment at the U.S. Global Change Research Program. And she joins us now to share how she's bringing more people into the conversation about climate. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So tell me about Art by Climate. Art by Climate is the first ever call for visual art to be featured in the National Climate Assessment. Um, we put out actually two calls for art, uh, one for youth and one for adults, with the goal of increasing the reach and the resonance of the National Climate um, Assessment and the climate change conversation. What kind of art? Are we talking like sculpture? Are we talking painting? Are we talking paint by numbers, which is all I would be able to do? <laughs> um, we got an incredible response from the call. We had over 800 submissions from across the country. Wow. The art ranges. Um, we have sculpture, we have installation, we have textile, painting, drawing. The youth art is incredible. And in, also in its printmaking and, and painting, they're really just so talented. Um, thematically, the work also really ranges. We have work about wildfire, about glacier melt, extreme events, people grappling with grief and anxiety and some people feeling hopeful or at least looking towards a hopeful future. So it's really quite a range. What made you decide to do this? Like what, what inspired this idea? So this came about when the um, director of the Fifth National Climate Assessment, Allison Crimmins, joined the USGCRP or the US Global Change Research Program and she said that she wanted to see more visual art in the National Climate Assessment. I have an informal arts background um, and so that really struck a chord with me. And we started to think about what that would really look like. And so we ended up teaming up with um, folks across the federal government who have interdisciplinary art science background from NOAA, from FEMA, from the National Portrait Gallery, from the Smithsonian uh, Natural History Museum. And together we kind of came up with this call for art. So how do you see earth and space sciences connecting with art? How do you see this intersection working and why is this important? I heard someone say once that emotion is the gateway to memory. If you think about a lot of the like most striking memories that you have, oftentimes they're emotional ones. And as we're trying to convey the importance and um, urgency of this moment for climate change, engaging the arts has never been more important because the arts reminds us of the human nature of this challenge and it um, allows us to bridge the, you know, the intellectual and the data that we have 
from the sciences with the intellectual and the emotional part um, that the arts bring. And together, it's just extraordinarily powerful. And are you seeing lots more scientists embracing these ideas and sort of wanting to see their own science and the work they're doing be represented in art? Yeah, I think so. I think the response has been really um, exciting. People seem really pleased to have this different take and bring in this different perspective. I will say one thing um, that I think is really important for our AGU community to think about um, in the context of art and science and bringing them together is that art is not science communication. And this was a really critical underlying principle that I held on to tightly throughout this. Art is its own um, way of documenting and observing and interpreting and imagining what the world could be like and what the world is like. And so kind of respecting the two disciplines as distinct ways of doing these things, but kind of seeing their combined power as something that really was important and kind of a guiding light in doing this very cross-disciplinary project. It sounds like a great project. Elisa Lustig, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks again for having me. Now we want to hear from you on the topic of connection. We asked attendees how you stay connected. Take a listen. I think forums like HU uh, provide a unique opportunity for us to make connections across different disciplines. So I set up a few meetings, like can we grab coffee? I go check out oral sessions with posters of colleagues. So it's a really great place just for different minds to meet. Going to as many social areas, so the, the grad student lunches, or going to seminars and uh, really making an effort to talk to people and learn about other people's sciences. The importance of making connections with Earth and science, space science, is to build up a community with people that you find are your friends, family, and just get them informed with any kind of passion or interest that you have. The most important factors of open science is, is being able to be interdisciplinary and sharing with, I know, the background, sharing the inputs as well as the outputs of your science. But what's the most important is to understand our planet and uh, we can um, interact with the society and uh, make the knowledge available to the general public. interesting because I mean there's challenges but I think the part where we tackle those challenges and our passion comes to play just makes it so much more interesting every day. Inspires new ideas and questions and collaborate. Science is amazing because you get to meet so many different people from all kinds of backgrounds in order to really further the science. I love science um, <laughs> and I, I want to spend my whole life on science and uh, I understand the basic, uh, the, the basic questions related to our lives. Art and science are both ways of exploring the world around us, of turning our observations into ideas that help explain what we see. So it makes sense that combining the two can create an even better understanding of our environment. Kate Simmons is the science director at the Nurture Nature Center in Easton, Pennsylvania. And she joins us now to talk about her work connecting art and science in the Create Connections project. Thanks for being here, Kate. Uh, thank you for having me. Why, how do you see art connecting with the earth and space sciences? And why is this important? So art and science are, are very, uh, to me, intimately intertwined. Um, the same critical skills are in both. Um, both using power of observations, both trying to make meaning of the world around them, um, and both really helping understand um, our environment. And so to me, it's, it's a logical connection. Can you tell us about any projects or research that you've come across where you see this collaboration in action? Yeah, so especially in my work with the Nurture Nature Center is that we try to integrate science, art, and community. And the art really helps get the community on board because sometimes um, the general public may be a little bit wary of science. They might not feel like they understand science or that you know it's above them. And so they tend to shy away from it or it's not for them. And art really helps break down those barriers and makes it much more accessible. So for instance, in one project we've been doing, 
where we're focusing on resiliency and trying to get the community to come together around the common vision of resilience, we've integrated art into that. So we had local artists do these large scale murals of a vision of community resilience and it was much more effective in engaging the community and having conversations than just a presentation about here are hazards and how they're changing because of climate. So you were talking a little bit earlier about how once upon a time scientists actually kind of had to be artists and then that kind of went away it feels like and as art is being integrated back into science do you find that there's a lot of receptivity to it? Are people excited about this idea? Um, yeah, I'm, are scientists embracing art? I see it growing. I think that there's some that might be hesitant because, again, it's another thing that they might not feel like they're an expert in and they don't know how or, or, or why they really should be integrating it into their work. And so we had this article in EOS where we tried to be like, well, why should you do this and how can you do this? And I've had lots of projects that have all, they're always very interesting to me that um, when I've been trying to connect artists to scientists, experts, because they're trying to study a particular issue before they create a piece, um, those interviews are really fascinating because the scientists are also like, I don't know how to talk to the artists, and the artists are like, I don't know how to talk to the scientists, but we all have common values and interests, and so. I'm usually the, the mediator there, and it's, it's really, they're, they're great conversations once you break down those barriers. Tell me about Create Connections. What's this project that you've been working on? So Create Connections is a NOAA-funded um, project where we are trying to make connections within our local community to see climate and resiliency as a whole community problem, and a whole community approach is needed. And so what we're doing is we're combining science, art, and community and doing things from public art installations to educational and outreach campaigns to working with the local libraries to working with um, local community-based organizations like community, uh, community Bike Works. And we're also doing annual youth climate summits in order to get the youth voice in there as well. But it's definitely... Um, been a, something that we've built too over the years and it comes on the back of some other really great work and all of it was really coming back to that science, art, and com community integration. Kate Simmons, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. When it comes to connections, international partnerships are vital. Partnership in International Research and Education, or PIRE, is merging data from the two largest tree ring and cave sediment archives in South America. Check out how this research will help better predict future events based on past model archive comparisons. Pyre Create is an international project that focuses both on research and education related to climate change in the Americas and we're looking at how climate varied in the past. Our partners in Brazil, for example, are experts in speleothem research. So they look at stalagmites and extract signals of past climate variability from caves. Our partners in Argentina are experts in tree ring research. So they help us to understand how climate has varied in the past on very high frequency timescales. I think it's very important to learn about what's happening with past climates because these will have impacts on how we live and how our societies and how our ecosystems function. The ability to look deep back in time and understand how the climates varied over the last 1,000 years creates a much better sense of the true natural variability of the climate system. And based on our understanding of the past, we know that the climate we see now is something that we've never seen before, and we really do live in a new climate era. Open science means not only communicating your work to other scientists, but to people outside the scientific world. Emily Ellis, a geosciences PhD candidate at Virginia Polytechnic University and State University, joins us now to talk about her efforts to make science accessible. 
Emily, thanks for being yeah, here. Thank you for having me. So you ran a session called Thinking Outside the Box Plot. Can you tell me what this was about? Yes. So the innovative session that we did was focused on unconventional ways to communicate science and how you can create fun and exciting ways to talk about your work. Um, and we were kind of working towards getting people who like use art or different time, types of visuals or how you communicate to different audiences. And we had some people talking about like using comic strips to communicate the cool. work, how you can best use TikTok or other <laughs> video methods to do that, or like how you incorporate art programs into research symposiums. And it was so much fun to organize and to just hear how everyone's communicating science. That is really cool. How did you come up with this idea? Like what inspired you? I'm on uh, AGU's hydrological section student subcommittee, H3S, and it's an early career student-led organization. And we were having conversations about how science communication has become really fun recently and that we wished that conventional sessions had a way to showcase some of these more fun ways to talk about science. And we were like, we could do an innovative session for this. And so we proposed that um, and it got accepted. Yeah. And we were really curious if anyone would sign up for it. And we had really great feedback on it. And so that was kind of the beginning of this session. And I would imagine that these kinds of presentations make this material more accessible to the general public. Why is it important to be able to communicate space and earth sciences to the layman? I think that is incredibly important because you can be doing the best science in the world and if you can't communicate that to people, how valuable is it? And I feel like a lot of the times when it comes to science, people may think it's a little unapproachable if you're not a scientist. And we need to find ways that we can talk about science that keep people interested, but also to where they understand it and can interact with it. So it's not just something the scientists are doing way off in the distance <laughs> that it trickles down eventually, but more like interactive so that way people can understand what's really going on with like Earth systems. So this fits pretty well then with this year's theme of wide open science, like making this so much more accessible. Exactly. I mean, we're not talking about just making it accessible to other scientists. It's like you're or working with other scientists. You're talking about bringing in writers and artists and poets and people from all sort of different areas of interest and background to try and tell these stories. Yes. And um, I think one really great thing about science communication and like these innovative sessions is that you can bring so many different perspectives into ways to communicate science because not everybody is coming from the exact same background and I think that helps when you're trying to make connections with people and part of the biggest thing with communicating your research is knowing who you're communicating to. So it's one of those you may need to shift the way that you speak about your research based on your audience and I think that flexibility is something that we also kind of covered in our session. Was there anything that came out of the session that you were particularly inspired by or like I want to do this or this is going to help my work or anything um, along those lines? I think one of the best pieces that I kind of gathered was just like moving forward we need to like think creatively about the way that we do our science and like even the way that we make graphics um, that it needs to be easily readable and accessible for everyone and I think that's just something that I'm going to keep in mind a little bit more with creating and publishing work is that you want everyone to be able to like resonate with it if that makes sense. Yeah. Emily Ellis, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. To Glasgow we go. The University of Glasgow, partnering with the Glasgow City Council, have been working on a multi-million dollar research program called Gallant. Check out how their research has turned the city of Glasgow into a living lab.
Gallant stands for Glasgow as a Living Lab Accelerating Novel Transformation, and it's a research program that's funded by the Natural Environmental Research Council in the UK. It's aimed at helping the city become more climate resilient and achieve its net zero targets. Being able to partner with a dedicated group of academics, bringing us research, expertise and knowledge to our policy making process to make sure that that policy making process is rooted in evidence, and that it's going to have the impact and the outcomes that we want it to have, that was so valuable. How do we come up with solutions that are beneficial for the environment? for people and health and are equitable and how do we also fold the economy into that. We are really focused on using that investment and that intervention to deliver net zero to improve the well-being of Glasgow's citizens. As an associate professor of Earth and Oceanographic Science at Bowdoin College, Michelle Levine teaches students from all backgrounds about how climate change is affecting our oceans. But she also sees the value in science communication, not just with her students, but also with the community she lives in. Michelle joins us now to talk about her work. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So tell me about what you've been doing in science communication, how you're trying to push this idea forward even more. Since I've kind of progressed through my career as a faculty member at Bowdoin College, I have become more and more interested in thinking about how to kind of expand the impact of the work that I do as a scientist and as an educator and living in Maine as well. I'm an oceanographer and so there's a strong connection between the local community and economy and the environment in particular in the ocean. And so I've been more and more interested in thinking about how this, not just the science that I do and the articles that you know, my students and I produce might impact the scientific discipline, but how that science could inform um, or could benefit you know, local communities, policy, and kind of expand the reach of my impact and share that with my students a bit. So this is more cross-disciplinary in some ways, like we're talking about economics, we're talking about um, you know, communities and, like, and actual science policy. It's not just like pure, unadulterated science and just trying to communicate that to people. Yes, and also a lot of what I've learned through doing it is that it's about building relationships and connections and trust with partners, either through um, you know, local organizations or with policymakers. Um, and so we're very much focused on the fact that we are scientists and we are experts in the scientific areas, but also respecting the expertise of other um, partners and um, members of you know, the shellfish industry, for example, and recognizing that they have a lot of understanding the ocean and a lot more experience out on the water than, you know, many of us who do science have, and so you know, really trying to build relationships and projects together um, to support communities or listen to policymakers. You know, what's the data that's missing in order to um, you know enact a certain policy? You know, how could we work together to you know get the data that we would need to fill those data gaps? And in your experience in Maine and talking about oceanography, like, are you finding these connections and these sort of you know maybe not a top-down approach, but sort of like a collective approach? effective and useful to your own research. So I work on ocean acidification, which part of my research is about that, which is the fact that the ocean is absorbing, you know, a good portion of the CO2 that humans are emitting to the atmosphere and that's changing the chemistry of the ocean and making it more acidic, making it harder for things that build shells to build those structures and so there's a clear connection to the shellfish industry for example in Maine. And so when I arrived in Maine, um, I was invited to join a group that was a collaboration between state legislators, scientists, community members, lobstermen, fishermen, and nonprofit organizations together that were just having conversations about what needs to be done and kind of forging a path together. So I was fortunate to um, step into that and have that be the first step that I could take in my um, research in this area. Yeah. Are you also working with other scientists and sort of pushing them in, in this direction too? Yeah. So that's where um, I you know, really got interested in it at the state level in Maine and it actually through support from AGU and the science policy group. There's a lot of support 
through their trainings and um, workshops and programs that help scientists think about um, connecting their research to federal policy as well. So I got started working with the uh, Voices for Science program as well as the Local Science Partners program that that um, group runs. And that really helps me connect with other geoscientists outside of Maine and other um, AGU members. We've gone around um, Capitol Hill and talked with our members of Congress about the research that we're doing locally and why it's important to our states and tried to connect that to um, federal policies as well. And so that's how I've started to connect with other people that might be also working with their students or um, designing research projects that are connected to policy in some way that has helped, you know, a new way that I've kind of connected with other people through AGU. Yeah, this seems like it all fits really well with AGU's theme this year of open science. Absolutely, yes. Michelle Levine, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. The Hawaii Partnership for Climate, Smart Commodities, is finding new ways to foster climate resilience and sustainability by connecting with local producers and ancestral practitioners the group is implementing climate smart practices in agroecosystems. The Hawaii Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities and my research program are committed to transformational efforts that rebuild resilience, health and equity in Hawaii's agroecosystems. By working directly with Hawaii producers and practitioners, we make sure that we are pursuing an equitable work and that our work is grounded on the needs of the people of Hawaii. Through our innovative and contemporary uh, approach to science that interweaves both Western and indigenous knowledge pathways, we hope to create a transformed system that acknowledges Hawaii's unique ecological and cultural context. Our partnership is striving for metrics of success in areas of increased local food production and meaningful climate benefits of sequestration, in addition to more holistic views of uh, social equity and improved resilience in food system. That does it for us for our fourth day here on AGU TV. We hope you've connected with our content. You can find the latest AGU TV episode on the TVs placed throughout the convention center, on the in house channels at several of our partner hotels, on the homepage of the AGU website, and on our YouTube channel and on X, formerly known as Twitter. Thanks again for joining us today. We still have a fifth and final day together. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.